One second. Now we're recording. Okay. Um, so first thing I'm going to ask is, um, um, everyone's pretty much done it already. Just yeah, mute yourselves. So that way I can I can sort of uh, go and obviously there's background noise. It won't be too distracting. Um, if you've got questions, type them in the chat box for now is what I'm going to suggest. And we'll come to them at the end. Um, the reason being is I've got quite a bit of information to get through. Um, and I think it will be easiest if uh, we just sort of do all the questions at the end. Um, what I'm also going to say is um, uh, I'm going to come, I'm going to admit this up front. The presentation I've made is I have thrown together in the last few hours. Um, it's been a pretty busy couple of days, so I haven't really had the time to do it properly. The plan is pretty comprehensive, so I can answer all the questions. I just may have left a couple of pieces out of the presentation. So if there's something in there that, uh, sorry, if there's something missing that you have a question, it's probably pretty legitimate and I might have missed it. So make sure you put it in the chat. Um, I'll be able to answer almost anything I feel at this point. Like I said, we've we've had a couple of weeks now of lots of back and forth with lots of different people. Um, so I don't think there's too many um, stones we haven't turned, if that's a correct way of using that saying. Um, okay, so uh, like I said, questions in the chat and uh, we'll get going here. I'll, I'll try not to take too much of your time, but like I said, there is a decent amount of information to present here. So I'm going to present my screen to you guys. Here we go. Okay. Um, can someone just unmute themselves and let them know if you can see the presentation? It's just a UDFC Summer 2020. Yes. I can't see you guys while I present. Perfect. All right. So, yeah, like I said, any questions, stick them in the chat and we'll get going here. So basic overview to start with. So like I said, these are just this is just the real basics. I just want to try and get you thinking about some of this stuff before we get into the details of all of it. And, and trust me, we, we will. Uh, and trust me, we'll get into the details for all of it. Um, I just want to give you something to think about big, big parts before um, we get into the, 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 the details of each. So basically, we split the club into three parts for this. Um, the treble A's, U12s, U18s, and then U10s and U11s. At the moment and for the next immediate future, which is the first cycle, which is on the right-hand side here, we're not going to run U9s or below. And I'll, I'll get into the reasons for that a little bit later. We're also not going to do the seniors just yet. Um, there is plans for both of those to be ran pretty soon. Um, but at this immediate point, we're not going to start with them. And like I said, I'll, I'll get into the reasons behind that a little bit later. As you guys probably know and have seen on with uh, Premier McNeil, uh, we're allowed groups of nine now. Um, in those groups of nine, we're allowed full contact uh, practices. So pretty much um, any sort of normal practice you would do in a, in a non-pandemic season, we can now do. Um, the reason it's nine is obviously um, that there's a coach which makes it 10. Uh, that coach needs to be able to not socially distance in case of injuries or stuff like that. So nine is our maximum contact um, for a group there are lots and lots of protocols uh, most of them are handled by the staff the, the summer staff we're going to hire so a lot of them won't necessarily need to be led by you but we do need you guys to abide by them so at the top of the screen here you see we only have one chance any breaks or mistakes and we could be shut down so that's going to be on every slide because I, I really can't emphasize enough how important this is um, if we are found to be breaking our protocols um, we will be shut down and there's a chance it won't just be us. It might be soccer and sport in general. Um, so we are in some extreme cases here. Like I said, we have the summer staff at all the fields and we'll get into that again a bit later. But um, we do need uh, the, all the coaches to be on board with this and abide by our protocols. The immediate plan right now is to have two cycles. We're calling them cycles. The first one is going to start um, in mid-July, and we'll get into those exact dates a little, in a little bit. Um, and it runs to, to the middle of August. There's going to be five or four weeks. I'll explain why there's a little bit of a difference there in a second as well. And then our second cycle will follow immediately after the first. So beginning the week after the first cycle finishes and run through to the middle of September. And that'll be four weeks for everyone. Um, we're not going to have teams necessarily. Uh, we will have groups, so you could consider that a team, I guess, but they're not going to be teams as per usual. So we're not going to pick them, for example. Um, they're basically going to pick themselves, but we are going to give the players as much information as we can beforehand. So when they are picking their, their group, 
um, they have a good idea what they're signing up for. And you guys as the coaches are going to be the keys to that. Um, this is some stuff that we're going to get into a little bit later. The one exception to the no teams is the treble A's. Um, and we'll get into the reasons why in a minute or so. And an important part to note as well is we are working at a li limited capacity here. Um, part of the partly reason why we have, we don't have the U nines or below right now. Um, no mini program either. We are limited to what, the spaces we have and the fields we can use at this point that hopefully will change um, as we move forward um, as we move forward through the summer but immediately we are very limited okay so we're getting to the program to start so a bit of an overview on what each program is going to look like so we'll start with the treble a's um, the treble a's are the easiest program to run right now um, the main reason being is that they are already in their teams. There's only six of them, six teams. Um, they all have coaches, uh, the majority do at least. Um, so basically, they're really sort of in being. So it's easy for us to to sort them out. Um, I do feel kind of bad for the Treble A's. They, this was their first uh, attempt at a one season. So their season was supposed to start in March and finish in October. So they didn't play in the winter. They didn't play games in the winter, at least. So they actually haven't played a game since last August, uh, the treble A players. So I do feel kind of bad for them. Um, they're already in their teams, like I said, um, 16, 17 or 18. Most of them are 17 or 18. I don't think any are 16 now. Um, so which is the perfect number for the max of nine per group. Which is we can split them into two. Um, the groups will be split into two and practice at the same time, one on each half of the field. Um um, we'll, that means that each team will need at least two coaches on the field at once, one to run each session. If that's not possible, I, um, I will contact the coaches and we'll make some changes, but that's the plan for now. Um, you can have more than the two coaches on the field, but any additional ones will have to socially distance, so they won't be allowed within two metres of any player. The programme for the Treble A's is going to be three practices a week, twice on weeknights for one hour. And then one practice on a weekend for an hour and 30 minutes. Um, I know that there was a lot of um, desire from the players and the coaches to have longer longer practices. It just isn't possible on the weeknights. And that was where our member survey said most people wanted to play. Um, so trying to fit weeknights in made it very, very difficult. Um, not to mention that if we have weekend practices... Um, that is a difficulty for the staff um trying to make trying to staff a field is very time consuming um which costs more which drives the cost up so we're trying to keep away from weekends but um the, the, to get the three practice of the treble a we needed a weekend on there at least once um this is the only sort of program if you if you want to call it that so the players will have to sign up for the three sessions a week for the five weeks for the for the initial five weeks in the cycle um so that just means that basically whatever the cost is per session, which um, we will be working out very soon based on the, the members, the second member survey going out tomorrow um, will be whatever that per session cost is times 15 for the first five week cycle. If that makes sense. Um, the AAA program is going to be our soft start. So it's going to start a week earlier than everyone else. Our sort of soft launch is what I mean to say. Um, so obviously being only six teams, it means we have a lot more control than when we start to go a bit more gung-ho with everybody else. So it means that we can go through the protocols, the field entry and exits, uh, and basically give it a bit of a test and see if it works properly. Um, the treble A's make the most sense to use because they're already in teams. There's only six of them, and it means we can do it on one field. Um, so the treble A's will start one week earlier just so that we can basically have our soft launch. Um, the base fields for the treble A program are going to be Auburn High and Tallahassee. We've kept away from turf because turf is significantly more expensive. Um, and based on our initial cost and pricing, um, by adding turf in, we're, we're adding significant dollars to it. So it's just not worth, uh, worth it to try and keep the price down. Keeping that price down for everybody has been a bit of a challenge. Um, the more people we have, the, the lower it will be. But we want to try and keep it on the grass fields for now. Um, as that drives costs down. One of the things that we are going to have to announce to our members is we aren't going to be able to do uh, refunds, uh, basically because we're going to have to invest a ton of money into staffing, um, personal um, protection equipment, such as hand sanitizer and stuff like that. 
So if we were to offer refunds at some point, we would, well, basically we wouldn't have the cost, the, the money to pay them back. So we're going to have to make this very clear during registration that when somebody signs up, uh, unfortunately, that's it. What that does mean is if there's rain outs or cancellations that are out of our control, um, we will have to do something. So for the travel aid program, uh, actually for all the program, we're, we're going to run a Zoom session for those players, for those sessions in the evening if there's a rain out. Um, that could that could be um, ran by the coach if they want to, or it could be ran by a staff member. So again, if, if we get to that point, if a coach, for example, wants a night off, maybe um, then we can contact the the summer staff and me, and we can and we can lead that for you. Uh, so Treble A is already in teams. Like I said, the registration will be done by invite. Um, so uh, very similar to how we've done it in previous years. Um, so the players will be invited to join. Makes it really easy for them, makes it really easy for us. So that is a quick overview of the Treble A program. Um, and we're going to get into this, but basically coaches of the Treble A, coaches of all the groups, you guys are going to be, um, as per normal, running your team however you guys see fit. Um, so it's planning your sessions, um, planning the sort of direction you want to go in um, and all that sort of stuff. So beyond this sort of the differences here, it's going to be very similar to what you usually have just with nine players instead of your normal full team. Before I move on, let me just check any questions, any questions about the travel aid quickly chuck in the chat. I give it. 10 seconds. If no one, we'll move on to the next one. So I know I just threw a lot of information at you there. Okay. We'll get into the next one. So the next one is the U12 to U18 programs. So um, they're all going to be ran the same way. So 12s, 13s, 15s, 18s. Um, that includes all the programs, Whitecaps, Prospects, CBA, and AA. I've got Treble A in there, but that's a typo. It's supposed to be say AA. Let me just correct that. There we go. So all those programs are going to be run the same way. Um, um, this is because we don't have teams currently. I know we made some up in um, late April. However, I don't think it's really fair to start placing players at this point, not to mention that it's, going to, it's just going to be a bit of a logistical nightmare. So we're going to run all the programs the same way. The coaches, you guys, are the absolute key to this process. Um, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to talk about styles in a, in a split second here, um, and we'll get into that. You guys, are, you guys are going to pick a style that suits you, a evening that you can coach, and a time that you can coach, and a field that you can coach. And then we're going to build that into the schedule, and we'll get to the schedule a little, a little bit later. Um, this is going to be basically what the players are now selecting for registration. So um, if, you got, if you look on the right over here, I've got an example. So let's say you're a U12 boys coach. You've picked Style A, you've picked Astral, you've picked 6 p.m. on Monday. So, you know, if you're a U12 boy, you're going to look at the schedule and you're going to say, oh, Coach um, Coach Adam is on Mondays at Astral, 6 o'clock, and he's Style A. Perfect. And that's what they're going to register for. And like I said, we'll get into the styles in a split second here. Still in groups of nine. So rather than having a team of, let's say, 18, similar to the Treble A's, we're just going to keep it to the groups of nine for now. Um, so you, as a coach, will be the lead for um, that group if you decide that you are willing to run more than one practice and so maybe it's two maybe it's three and we'll get into that in a, literally in a split second then you will be responsible for all of those groups um, but if you only want to run one practice you will be only responsible for that group if that makes sense um, similar to the treble a's we're still limited by our numbers so there'll be one coach per group one lead coach per group if you want assistance with you, you can, but they have to socially distance. Um, so they won't be allowed to step onto the field. They're not allowed to sort of help the players. They're not allowed to move cones, all this sort of stuff. They just really have to stand there and sort of yell from a distance, I guess, from two meters away. It'll be registered. Players are registered as first come, first serve. So like I said, you've set yourself up um, and then players will be picking. So um, I get into this a little bit later, but what I would recommend to the coaches is once you have your time, style and field booked with me, um, and I, we'll get to that later, um, I would recommend reaching out to your players from previous seasons and letting them know that's the one that you're, you're going to be running and to get them to sign up. Um, give them the information in advance, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, this does leave us open a little bit to having 
Um, you, you know, you might you might have, for example, a, a stronger group of players that want to stick together, and there may be a player that maybe traditionally isn't in that group who signs up. But we are we are left open to that. If that happens, then um, we're. I, I, as the director of soccer, will reach out to them and, and maybe offer them a, a style which is more suiting. But if they want to stick with it, we're gonna we're gonna have to um, honor that. Um, first come, first serve is the easiest way to do it. Like I said, we we will uh, contact those players if we feel there's a different style or different coach that fits better. But we will honor it if they want to stay with it. Um, after registration is done. Um, if there are spaces, so sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Players initially will only be allowed to sign up to a maximum of two practices. Um, the reason for this is purely because we have a limited capacity and we want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to practice at least once a week. Um, so um, if we start saying, okay, you can sign up for as many as you want, one kid signs up for five, and then well, maybe there's a kid who gets left with zero. So to start with, we're going to offer them a maximum of two. So the players can either do one or two practices per week. Um, that will be their choice and they'll be able to pick. Um, after re registration is done, if there are spaces left over, we will offer those to those players that wanted more. Part of the registration will have a little box to tick if they're interested. So once registration is completed, we'll say, hey, you know what? There is an option for a third or a fourth or a fifth practice here if you want it. Are you still interested? And we can go from there. Similar for coaches, you guys can run as many as week as you want. Um, just in case there is a high demand, uh, um, I am going to say two lead practices to start. So I'm going to say, for example, Adam, you can only run two practices as a lead this week. You can be assistant for as many as you like. Uh, but right now you can only lead two. And then once again, if we get to a point where there is gaps and you want to run a third or a fourth or a fifth, we can absolutely discuss that and, and give them to you if there's gaps. Um, there's going to be a lot of, there's a lot of unknown still at this point. Um, and hopefully that will become clearer as we do the member survey in the next couple of days. And uh, you guys fill in the um, confirmation of coaching and schedule stuff, which we'll get to later. Lots of unknowns, um, and, but we'll know within the next week or so. So we currently have assigned two practices per age, gender and style. So that means that, for example, I've got the same example we just used a minute ago here. If you're a U12 boy, you basically have eight practices to pick from. Two are, two are a style A, two are a style B. Who was that that just came in? Can't see them. Two are a style B, two, two are a style C, two are a style D. And I'll, I'll tell you what those styles are in a split second here. Uh, and then we've really touched on if this demand will give, will give more. Um, and our member survey is going out tomorrow. So although it's two for each one right now, if our member survey comes back tomorrow and you know the, the demand is everybody wants to do style D, no one wants to do the other three styles, then we'll just move all eight practices to style D. So there is flexibility there, but to begin with, we wanted to make sure it was equal um, for everybody in case we don't know what the spread's going to be. So like I said, that could be adjusted depending on what our member survey comes back with, um, which we're going to send out tomorrow. Plan start date for this program is the 20th, so the week after the treble A's, and then they will have their four-week cycle so that we're lined up again um, so that the treble A's and 12 and 18's finish at the same time. And that means the second cycle, they're both be four weeks and they're now aligned. Um, similar to the treble A's, if, a, if the players are signing up for a, a number of practices, so, if they, so as the example says here, if they decide to sign up for two practices a week, because it's four weeks, they're essentially signing up for eight. If they decide to sign up for one practice that week, then same thing, they're essentially signing up for four now, if that makes sense. Um, the base fields for the 12 and 18s are Astral and Ocean View. Um, because the 12 and 18s is the biggest program um, the club's running right now, um, there will be some spillage onto the other fields, but we're gonna. the main fields are going to be Astral and Ocean View. Um, Similar to the treble A's, if there's a rain out, then um, we will have to run a, a Zoom call that evening. The staff can run that if the coach doesn't want to. If the coach is happy to, then fantastic. Uh, and the club can provide the, the links if you need the the, the uh, Google Meets link if you if you need it. Registration will be done through Demosphere as per usual. Um, like I said earlier, the players will know what they're signing up for 
um, in, in advance, which will make it nice and easy for them. So the styles, um, four different styles. I think they, they're all pretty, uh, they all make sense. Sort of um, going from the simplest one, which is style A. So this is just going to be scrimmage only. So it would be the easiest one to lead as a coach. Your job is literally just to show up, um, help them set up a scrimmage and just sort of manage it, really. Um, you don't have to coach at all. You can even join in if you like. Uh, this is purely just based at those kids who just really want to play games. They don't care about the drills. They don't care about the activities. They just want to play games. Um, an idea the clubs had, which we will think about trying to bring in later, is maybe having some in-house um, scrimmages. Uh, not something we feel like we can do just yet based on our fields. But um, expanding this and having like an uh, in-house, sorry, excuse me, uh, in-house or tournament might be something we can do later on. Style B is sort of a step up. Uh, well, step up is probably the wrong word, but um, this time we're going to build in fun games and activities as well as a scrimmage. Probably similar to what normal B or A sessions would look like. Um, so there'll be fun games with the, with the main concentration on making sure the kids are having a blast. We're not too worried about development with style B. Um, just making sure the kids have a blast, leave with a smile. Style C is when we start moving into more of a developmental focus. Um, obviously, we want to have fun all the way through. So that's, that's always a goal of a soccer practice. But at style C now, we're starting to say, okay, we want some coaching points. We want to try and help the players get better. We want to improve them. Um, the session designs become more important. And then style D, I would say, is the most intense. Um, this is a strong de 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 developmental focus. <laughs> developmental focus. Um, probably similar to what a double A AA or treble A team would run. Um, so, like I said, what I'm going to do after this, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of, in, the, in the presentation a little bit here. But um, once you've confirmed that you want to be a lead coach this summer with the club, which will be the first step, the second step is I'm going to ask you which field, which times and which style you would like to be. Um, and then that will be what we put in the schedule. So you will choose if you're a style A, B, C or D. Any questions about – good question, Amanda. Amanda asked if we got any uh, previous players' lists. I can absolutely sh uh, share, you, share with you your previous season's players' list if you like. Um, definitely, I can definitely do that. Any other questions about the 12 to 18 program? Last thing I should probably mention as well, if a player – yes, yes, Kelly. Yes, so they'll still be split by age and gender. So there'll be a 12 boys, a 12 girls, 13 boys, 13 girls, 15 boys, 15 girls, 18 boys, and 18 girls. Good question. It's a really good question. So they're split by age and gender. Keeper training, I haven't got it built in yet. Um, but if there's a demand, which I think there probably will be, um, that, that could probably come in with the U9s and seniors in a little bit of time. We are limited by our field capacity. So I'm just trying to make sure we get on the field first. Keep a training. Um, we will try and building as, as we move forward. It's a good question as well. Um, sorry, last comment on this one before I move on. Um, players don't have to pick, if players want to pick two practices a week, they don't have to pick the same style and the same coach. So, you know, um, little, little Johnny decides he wants one practice in style D where he's going to work his, his butt off and, you know, become the best player he can. But he also wants a style A practice where he can have just play scrimmage and have a good time. So that's completely open to the player. All right. 10s and 11s. This is very similar to the 12s and 18s. There isn't a huge amount of difference, except we've removed the styles. Um, so it's just going to be a U10 program, U10 boys, a U10 girls, a U11 boys, and a U11 girls. Um, each age and Gender, so U10 boys, for example, will have eight practices, the same as the other age groups. Um, and um, th th because we they're a bit younger and we have the skill set and model, you know, the, the soccer is always going to be based on having a good time, lots of dribbling, lots of touches, um, and lots of scrimmages. So we didn't feel like the styles were as necessary at these younger ages. Um, so, but everything else will be very, very similar. We'll have the coaches, the head coach of the group. You will have your nine players. You can do all the practices, all the normal sessions and drills you would usually do. If you want an assistant, absolutely, but they have to socially distance. Uh, they start at the same time, July 20th, four week cycle. Players are allowed to sign up for up to two again. If they want to do more, we'll have to wait till registration closes. Um, 
and apart from that, it's very much the same. So coaches, you're still picking a night and a time and a field that works for you. And that's what's going to be on the schedule. So the only difference is going to be that we don't have the styles for the U10 and 11 program. Any questions on, on the U10s and U11s? Oh. Can everyone, is my screen still working? Okay. Questions on 10s or 11s? Um, I did a lot of the talking for that one in the 12s to 18s. So I... Um... Okay. So the last one is the minis, the skills in 8 to 9s, and the senior programming. So I just wanted to talk about this for a second because just because we're not running programs right now doesn't mean they're any more or less important than everyone else. Um, the original decision to not do the minis and the younger skill center ages was made from the, the first announcement of um, programming. So obviously we needed parents on the field. And at that point, uh, there was just no point running anything because we didn't have, well, it's no point running a session with four kids and four parents on a field. Obviously, the change from last week when Premier McNeil allowed us to do contact did change everything. At this point, U9s are allowed to be on the field without a parent, although it is recommended. Um, for the younger ages, we still need a parent. Um, however, we just at this point in time, we with our limited capacity, we don't think we're ready for these ages yet. Along the, along the same lines, one of our biggest concerns is the control of the players. Um, as I keep saying at the top here, we, we can't afford any breaks or mistakes. Um, so, you know, if you've got a U7 or a U8 player and they decide to run across because they see their friend on the other half of the field, we're in trouble. So at this particular moment, we just want to try and be safe, stay within our current capacity. Um, and we're just not quite there yet. We are working already on trying to figure out if we can get the, the U9s and younger back in for the second cycle in starting in um, in mid-August. Um, so that is our plan. Um, but we, like I said, at this moment, we're not quite there yet. Um, I know that's not the best news for the players of that age. And trust me, I, I'm disappointed as well. But safety has to be number one. And at the moment, we don't think we're able to do it within our current capacities. Seniors is uh, a little bit different. The vast majority of seniors want to play games. Obviously, we can't do that. Um, so built in, as I mentioned earlier, we are looking at trying to maybe set up tournaments or 5v5s as the summer goes on. That's something we can look to do. Um, but again, we have to follow that protocols right now. So the seniors is something we're looking at as well. Hopefully we can build that in later on. Um, so yeah, at the bottom here is, is the line. Put simply, we need to get the simple parts done well first. So with the older players, it's easier to control them. And the players have more of an understanding of what soccer looks like. The coaches are usually a bit more experienced, not always the case. Obviously, we have some fantastic coaches, but in particular with the minis, the coaches are not as experienced usually. Um, we'll get the rest of the club done really well. And then when the U9s and the younger come back, it's going to be perfect. So I know that uh, kind of sucks for, you, for the coaches of those groups. Um, I, I hope, you, hope you understand. Any questions about that last piece? Uh, like, like, yeah. All right, so let's get into protocols and processes. This is the fun part. Um, sorry, I just got a text from Susan there, which and she's right. I, I did forget to mention something. We are we are looking at some virtual training for the minis and U eights and U nine skill centers. Um, so that is something we're going to look to do. That will be free, so we're not going to. It's not going to cost anything. Um, we, obviously, like I said, you, just because we're not running programming doesn't mean they're not important. So we are working at looking at a way of trying to run some virtual online stuff. The minis, we have a ton of mini gear. Um, we're currently working with Tim Horns to see if we can give that out now anyway. So those mini groups will might have their mini gear and they might have some virtual sessions and the same with the U8s and U9s. Um, so I'll, I'll touch base with the U8 and U9 skill center coaches in particular. Um, over the next uh, few days um, and, and try and figure out the best way to get that done. Thank you, Susan, for reminding me. Okay, uh, protocols and processes. So, uh, like I said, this is going to be a bit... <laughs> if, you thought the, 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 if you thought the last 30 minutes was a bit dry, this is going to get real dry. Just to prepare you. Um, okay, so um, 
these are the sort of protocols now that we're getting into that we can't break. Um, so it's important that we know this. Before I get into these, every single one of you, if you want to be a lead coach, is going to have to watch a, a video on this. And I'm, I promise you it will be a bit more fun than just me talking at you like it is now. Um, it will be you know, actual people going through the process so you can see it rather than just someone explaining it. Um, so you'll have to do a video on all of these protocols um, and then answer, answer a questionnaire. So that's our way of sort of covering the, uh, the club's butt, saying we've done the video presentation and all of our coaches has passed the questionnaire so that they know the information. Um, so that will be coming in the next couple of weeks uh, before we get on the field. But I want to give you a bit of an idea of what you're looking at before you make a decision that whether you want to coach or not. I think that's the absolute least we should do um, before you can make any decisions. So field entry and exit protocols. So first things first, car park and travel. Um, so every field we've picked, uh, the six I mentioned earlier, um, actually, I don't know if I've told you the fields yet. I think that's later on in the presentation. Uh, we have six fields that we are working from. Each have two entrances. That means that one group comes in and exits one side, and then the following group, the group that comes in after them, enter and exit the other side of the field. That way we're stopping cross-contamination. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit in a little bit later. Um, so let's say your, your group has just arrived at entrance number one. Your practice is at six o'clock and we're off and running. You've come up to the field entry and exit uh, gate. So the little picture on the right here, it looks terrible. I know. Sorry, I'm not the best on, well, just on designing that sort of stuff. You can ignore the yellow lines. That originally was our pathway, which we needed up until last Thursday. So thank goodness that's gone. Um, the little blue line, the little blue circle, sorry, are our social distancing um, measurements. So in real life, these will piece, be pieces of tape on a fence or lines on the ground, but they will be, they'll be measured out somehow. So the players will line up in the social distance um, circles. So there'll be one player here, oops, one player here, one player here, etc. Can you see my mouse? Oh, you can't hear me. I can't hear you guys. They will wait here. They'll wait until the previous group has entirely left the field. So um, they can't, one player cannot enter until the entirety of the previous group has left. There will be a staff, summer staff member here. Coaches, you are in this lineup as well as the players. So you will have to enter and exit the exact same as the players. So everything we go through here applies to you and the players. Summer staff will be at this, at this table, the red, the red table. They will... Um, once they are good to go, they'll invite people up one at a time to sign in and sign out. You will grab a pen from the clean pen pile, sign the, sign the questionnaire. Um, this is on the other page now. I should have put the picture on the other page. Um, they will... I'm just thinking how to do this. We'll jump to this page. Um, they will pick up a pen. They will sign the hard copy sheet player entry to the field. This will be a, a very quick questionnaire, basically asking the individual symptoms and if the player or coach has had them in the last 24 hours. So you'll be like, have you had a cough in the last 24 hours? And you guys will say, no. Have you had a fever in the last 20, uh, 24 hours? No. And you'll go through each one. And at the bottom of the sign-in sheet, it will say, please sign here to confirm that you haven't had any uh, COVID-19 symptoms. So that is going to have to be done at every entrance to the field by everybody who enters the fields. Players at U10, 11, 12, or 13, we are going to ask a parent or guardian or a, an older sibling even to join them. Reason being is um, if something does go wrong and we have to present all of this, all these documents to HRM, we, if we say that a 10-year-old has filled out this form, it, it, well, they're going to look at us and say, you let a 10-year-old sign this form and it, we're going to, it's not going to look great. So for those ages, we are going to ask a parent and or sibling or guardian to come along and, and do that for them or with them. Um, 14 and older, we are going to allow the players to um, fill that form in themselves. Um, that age is that age cutoff is something that uh, me and the board felt was fair. I know it's a bit of an overkill, but again, we we, tr we have to cover our butts here. Um, it's it's really important that we that the protocols are safe and are followed, and we can back up why we're doing certain things. Um, along with the sign in and sign out sheet, there will also be a booklet with the staff. This will have all the normal stuff that a coach would have, emergency contact, medical details, 
Um, confirmation that both the player and the coach has completed the training. If you haven't completed the training beforehand, you will not be allowed on the field. That is the video I mentioned, video and questionnaire I mentioned earlier. Um, the, the staff will have to wear masks and gloves at all time. As a coach, you won't have to. Um, it's entirely up to you. If you want to, you are more than welcome and we would encourage it. But as a coach, it is up to you. Um, after you have gone through the sign-in sheet, got your hand sanitizer. Oh, sorry, I missed the cleaning your hand sanitizer right at the top here. So the first thing you do is you, your hand sanitize. Then you grab your pen. Then you sign in. Um, and then you can go onto the field. You're told which half of the field you're supposed to be on. Um, as a coach, I haven't got this on here because this was from the player one, but as a coach, you would grab your gear bags at this point, and there's two of those. Um, I will go into those in a couple of slides time, but this would be the time when you would grab your, your playing gear and your uh, personal protection equipment gear. So then before the start of the play, coaches, the first thing you guys are going to have to do before every practice is you're going to have to read a script written by the club. Um, this script is just going to basically be telling the players the very basic stuff like, you know, you can't grow, go into that side of the field. Uh, if you leave the field, you're not allowed back in. Uh, all, the, all the basic protocols, pretty similar to what we're saying here. Um, again, we're just covering our butts. You know, we know what young players are like sometimes. They sometimes forget the rules. If we read this script before every practice, we're reinforcing those rules. Um, and that way we're limiting the amount of mistakes that might be made. Players will not be allowed to move halves. So if they're on the right-hand half, for example, they will not be allowed at any point to go into the left-hand one. Uh, same with coaches. Um, the socially distanced assistant coaches can move back and forth, but they must socially distance at all times. But the, co the lead coaches who are interacting with the players cannot switch halves at any point, no matter what happens. That's really important. If a player in the other half has broken their leg, you can't go over and help. I mean, again, this, this, I know it sounds terrible, but um, the responsibility of that looking after that player will be the lead coach of that group. So whoever's over there leading that player will be the person. Uh, at the end of the session, you grab all your equipment, you grab all your gear, um, and then you, you, you move towards the exit. The exit is exactly the same as the entry, just in reverse. So you do your hand sanitizer. Sorry, your socially distanced line up. You do your hand sanitizer, you sign out, uh, and then you are good to go. As a coach, you'll be dropping off your equipment, the two bags of equipment in the dirty area. Like I said, we'll get to that in a couple of slides time. The field entry and exit is where most of the most of the stuff happens. So this it's really important we know this. And if you're not, if you don't be too worried if you can't remember all this stuff. Like I said, there's going to be I'm going to make a um, a way more fun video. Um, and I'm mostly recording this right now as well. So um, there's going to be options to, to look back and don't be too anxious about not memorizing this stuff right now. Okay, uh, minor and serious injuries at the field. So obviously you are, like I just mentioned, you are the lead coach. So if somebody goes down with a minor injury, like, like it happens 99 times a session, ankle twist, scrape knee, etc. Something that's not a big deal. Um, in that you will have a second, you'll have two equipment bags. One will just be the normal equipment. The second will be with the PPE equipment um, and first aid kit. So before you can go over, and I know this sounds crazy because you've just been running a session, you've probably been touching them, but just before you go over and assess a player who's injured, you must put on the gloves and mask in your PPE bag. Um, then you can go over and assess as per normal. Um, you know, you can help as much as you can. You know, there's a first aid kit there. They need a band-aid, great. You know, do your usual, what you would usually do in that situation. If the player just needs a break like they usually do, just let them say, go off to the side. And then when they come back in, they come back in. No problem. If a player has to leave and go home, they need to follow the same protocols and exit as we just talked about. Um, at this point, I would, if I, if what I would expect the coaches to do is just let the summer staff know the player is coming over and they can handle it from there. And you can stay with your team. Um, a serious, a serious, a serious, oh, I've gone back too far. A serious injury, you know, broken bones, stuff that requires an ambulance or professional help. Same, same process. You still have to put on your gloves and mask. And I know, again, that's going to be difficult to do. You're going to have potentially a player on the floor screaming. But it's really important you put on that mask and that gloves. And I, I know that sounds horrible. Um, but again, we, it's 
these aren't my rules, unfortunately. These are rules from SNS, uh, CSA, and HRM. Um, as per usual, attend the player, assess the injury. So steps one, two, and three are the same, obviously, for both. Um, it, as soon as you know it's a serious injury, that's when you're going to have to involve the summer staff. So they will be there all the time. Some, and I, I have this in one of the slides. The summer staff are there to help you. Um, they're also the leads for the field. So what they say goes, but they're there to help you. They're not there just to have their feet up. So as soon as you know it's a serious injury, get the summer staff involved. They can call 911 and the parent and or guardian. Um, and we have obviously a second summer staff. We can end the practice. We can put all the, move all the non-injured players to the exit gate and go through the protocols properly. So the second summer staff can handle that um, while the first summer staff helps you with the injured player. And then at that point, um, it's up to you whether you stay or you leave. The summer staff are there and there's two of them. So they will be able to handle the situation. Obviously, I think most of you guys would stay there, which is great. Um, but there, there are basically three of you there to handle the situation, which um, is actually way better than it would be in a normal summer where it's likely just you or you and someone else. Okay, the big one, COVID-19 symptoms. This is the one everyone's scared of. So if there's a COVID-19 related issue at the session, and I need to precursor with this with, nobody can answer the question of what's the difference between a COVID-19 symptom and a normal cough or a normal fever. So all we can say is we have to be better to be safe than sorry. So if a kid's coughed once or twice, probably okay. If a kid's coughing pretty consistently and they look sick, then we need to start making um, following this process here. Always got, and I say this in the coaching courses, and I say this um, whenever we talk about first aid and, and injuries, we have to be it's better to be safe than sorry. So if we need to end a practice immediately uh, because we think someone might have some symptoms and they don't, I would much rather that, like infinitely rather that than where nah, they may, may, they may not have COVID, we'll carry on the whole session and then suddenly all 10 of you have got the, you know, the disease. So better to be safe than sorry. So if you think someone has is showing symptoms during a practice, we have to end the practice immediately. Inform the summer staff. So again, they're, they're there to help of the, of the issue. Um, we inform the players that we're worried that someone has um, been showing symptoms. The summer staff will, and this is step number four, but it doesn't be done, need to be done immediately. There's more important things to be done at this point, but so I might move this one down. The summer staff will have to uh, complete the COVID-19 report form um, with, with the coach. I will be informed by a phone call and I will come and help. All the players would go home. They'd have to follow the same protocols as they as we usually do. Socially distance at the gates, sign out, et cetera, et cetera. I will immediately send an email to all the players on that field. So all 18 will have an email from me saying that we have suspicions. Um, all players, coaches, staff will be told to contact 811 and follow the guidelines. Um, that will likely lead to them being tested. Um, so every single person will be called 811. The player with the symptoms, and if I'm honest, uh, I only got the player written down here, but if I'm honest, all 18 players, I will likely give a phone call to and explain the situation as well as the email. Um, it's always better, I think, to hear that, com hear that information through a voice than it is through an email. So I'll, I'll be calling everybody and letting them know what's, what's happened and why the practice has ended early. Um, practices with that team will be suspended until we are given the all clear. So that may be um 811 saying no 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 that's not those aren't real symptoms you're good to go okay fantastic or it might be all right now you need to go get tested uh, and then we'll have to wait for the test to come back um so any questions on that one i've got some questions here and i'll jump into these before i move on okay mitchell good question what happens if the ball rolls from one half to the other um if it's as long as it's kicked back and it has to be kicked that's fine if it if it roll if it flies into the other half and hits somebody or um you know that's not a kick that ball has to be clean before it can be used again it's a great question um so what would happen was we'd have to leave that ball as a coach you'd have to inform the summer staff and say this ball is now technically dirty um and we'll have to we'll have to uh someone in the half where the ball rolled hits it back or stop yeah, so sorry, Craig's kind of right. If it's along the ground, if it's just rolled across the line, you're allowed to kick it back. If it if it flies through the air and hits somewhere other than a uh, 
a foot, they now have to be taken out and cleaned. Uh, you probably cover this both. Masks will be in. Yep, yeah, we will provide masks in a P, in the PPE bag. Um, um, we will, and gloves as well. That'll be in the PPE bag in case you have to deal with someone who's injured. Um, you can use those from session to session if you like. We are going to be pretty limited in the amount we have. I mean, don't get me wrong here. We're not going to be like scrounging around for them, but. I don't think as a club we can afford to give everyone just a, a mask per session, um, but there will be enough in there for um, for the first aid stuff to be dealt with, if that makes sense. That's a good question, Kelly. So Kelly said here, if we have allergies, should we even bother coaching? I, I really haven't got an answer for you. Uh, like I said, I've asked this question on SNS a couple of times now, and it's like, you know, hay fever for example like you know well how can you differentiate between hay fever and a COVID-19 sim symptom um what I would say is if, if you have allergies um and you only have um a couple of the symptoms and, and you are very confident it's just your allergies I think we can make some uh I think we'll be okay obviously if you're feeling sick then um yeah, and so Susan mentioned I've been sneezing on on she's there so I wouldn't say it stops you coaching uh Kelly uh, but um, it, it is going to be, a, it's difficult to differentiate and I haven't really got an answer for you, but, um, as long as we know that you have those allergies, I think that will cover us. Um, but I, I am going to keep following up on that one. Like I said, I haven't actually got an answer. I have asked it a couple of times myself. So yeah, if you've got allergies, it's, uh, come make sure you make it aware to us at, at the first, uh, at first. And, um, and then, you know, maybe when you get to the field, you can say, look, you know, I've got a bit of a sneeze right now. I'm 99.9% sure it's my allergies. And I might just be making a note of it on the sheet, on the assignment sheet. Jeff's asked about registration fees. Yeah, registration fees will be on a per session basis and they'll be the same for the whole club. So it doesn't matter if you're a treble A player or a double A, oh, sorry, treble A player, U12, U18, 10s or 11s. Um, you will pay a per fee session for the amount of practices you you have. So the treble A's we playing will be paying that per session fee three times for a week. Um, everyone else will be paying one or two of those um, for for however many they sign up for. Okay, where are we at now? So the reporting process. Oh, that's wrong. That's, we've done that bit already. Okay, we'll skip that one. I've made a mistake there. The reporting process basically is going to be, if you've seen anything that um, I've, I've just, somehow I've messed that up. One second. Maybe it's underneath. Oh, I've made a mistake somewhere there. Um, the reporting process, if you see any breaks in protocol, tell the summer staff immediately. That is pretty much the, the reporting process. They are going to know the, the process inside and out and what to do. They're going to be trained literally once a week for the first month. So um, anything that happens, let them know. And when I say anything, you know, maybe a dog's ran on the field and, and the, the owners ran on after them. Maybe, uh, it, you know, like we mentioned a ball going into the other half. We need to make sure that all of that is documented. So it could just be as simple as, hey, um, summer staff, Sam, whoever it is, um, just to let you know, this ball rolled into that half. The player kicked it back. It only just rolled in. Summer staff are going to know what to do with that and where to record it. Maybe it's, you know, um, a little a little six-year-old just ran onto the field because they're walking down the path. They ran on, they grabbed someone's leg. Okay, well, there's nothing we can do about that, but we need to make sure that we have it documented. Um, so when we say breaks in protocol, uh, if it's out of our control, we can at least argue it. Like I said, if a six-year-old runs in the field, what can you do? But if we're breaking our protocols, like, a, a, you know, a coach or one of our players changes across the field, then, then we could be in trouble. But the key is documentation. So if something goes wrong and HRM and Soccer Nova Scotia and Canada Soccer say, we need to have all the documents you have for this night or this group of players, we are able to provide them. And that's not on you guys as coaches. That's on the club and the summer staff and me. Um, so don't worry too much about that. But anything you see, report it to the summer staff at your field. Okay, uh, breaks in protocol. So... Uh, um, this isn't meant to scare you. I know I've been pretty over the top with the, the no breaks or mistakes, um, but we do have to have some uh, rules in place in, in case. So if if a coach breaks the protocol, it's going to be a verbal warning first and foremost. Um, it'll be from me. Um, 
obviously there's different severities, but um, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, things are going to happen. Um, do your absolute best, but uh, your first one will be a verbal warning. The second time, um, we will ask you to do the training again. That means re watching the video, redoing the questionnaire. And if we have a third break, we might have to ask you not to coach anymore. Um, like I said, if we, you know, even the first one, which is a verbal warning, if we get if we get caught with it, um, it could be it leading to us being shut down. So it's like I said, it's pretty intense. Um, I know I'm giving a little bit of mixed messages here, but it's 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 pretty intense. We're not going to be watched like hawks, but at the same time, we need to be following the guidelines as best as possible. Players are a little bit less severe because obviously they're a bit younger. Um, is the main reason. I think the way we uh, the way we would handle it, like a U18 versus a U10 might be slightly different, but this is our protocol over right now. As per usual, a first warning, um, a second break in the same night. We'll make them do. We'll make them have to rewatch the training again, do the questionnaire again, and a third break in the same night. We'll have to move the, remove them from the program that for that night, for that night only. Sorry, I should make that clear. If a player gets to this three break three breaks twice on two different nights, then we will have to remove them from the program. Um, obviously, it's, if it happens once, you can go, well, maybe we had a bad night. Maybe we got away with it. Um, if it happens twice, then there's probably a, a more of a deeper problem there. And I've got this report in form down here. This is the form that we're going to um, uh, report to the summer staff. So like I said, if you see anything, and, and sometimes it's going to, it might feel bad, like you might be put, it might be throwing a player under the bus. But again, it's, we've got we to gotta have everything recorded. Okay, sorry. I know this is the most dry presentation in history, I know. Okay, um, equipment. So like I said, you'll, you will have two bags. Um, it's really important, and this came up last night in the SNS meeting, that um, <clears throat> only you as the coach touch the equipment. The only exception being is the balls. So laying down cones, laying down the nets, pumping the balls up, um, any additional equipment you want, it's important that only you as the coach touch that. I know that sounds kind of insane because we're all going to be sweating on each other and bumping into each other, but that's that's what we're being told. So with the exception of the balls, everything has to be touched by you. So as the coach, you're laying it all out. If something needs to be moved, you're the one that's going to have to move it. And at the end, you're the one that's going to have to collect it all back together again. Uh, I know that really sucks, um, um, but that's where we're going to have to be. In the bag, we will have 10 balls, the correct size for your group, um, 25 cones, four big, uh, 25 flat cones. We have at least two different colors in there. Four of the bigger cones, um, we'll, we'll get you at least one pug net, um, a ball pump. And then if you want additional stuff, for example, maybe you want a second pug net, maybe you want ladders. If we have it, let's make sure you we know in advance and we will bring it to the field for you, so that, if that makes sense um yeah so that's a pretty general ball bag um like a gear bag and uh, like i said if you want additional stuff just ask and we will do our best to make sure you have it pennies are a lot uh are quite difficult because they need to be washed um it's easy to wash the cones and balls and anything that's kind of solid something a bit more knitted is a bit is harder so rather than i'm frozen can everyone, can you hear me? Thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, that's good. Um, can it, thumbs up if you can see equipment on my presentation right now. Can you see breaks in protocol? Okay, one second. I'm going to stop presenting and I'm going to try and bring this back up again. Okay, thumbs up if you can see equipment right now. All right, good. Bit of a refresh. That's all we needed. Okay. Um, where was I at here? Pennies. Yeah, pennies are. Uh, we have to wash them. So we're potentially going to have about. 800, 900 different players on the field over the course of a week. So with that being the case, there's no way I can wash a thousand pennies per week. I just, 
Don't know how I'll do it. So what we're going to ask, and this is in the member survey tomorrow, is that players bring players wear their UDFC navy jersey or their UDFC green jerseys to practice. Um, at this point, we don't think everybody has those. We think most do, but not everybody. In the cases of players that don't have them, we're going to ask for a light and a dark shirt. Um, so that means, you know, the light will hopefully go with the green and the dark will hopefully go with the navy. Um, so that way we don't have to provide pennies. We don't have to deal with washing them. The players will basically be in colors already. So what I'm going to ask of the coaches, um, obviously the biggest problem, sorry, I mean, I'm going ahead of myself. The biggest problem with this potentially is that means players might be, you know, changing their shirt in the middle of a practice, which A, isn't ideal. B, some players would hate that. And uh, C, I just don't, it's a difficult situation to put those players in. So what we're going to ask is if coaches can, if you guys can, try and let your players know in advance which color to wear for that night. Um, so it might be as simple as a message before the practice saying these four players wear lights or navy, oh, sorry, light or green. Uh, these five players wear dark and navy. Um, if you want to make it really easy for yourself and you don't want to do that before every practice, you could probably do it before the first one and then just ask them to wear those colors for the rest of the rest of the, the five week cycle. Um, that way you're always going to have your teams made in advance. It makes, it does make it difficult to switch players, but it will make it easier. If you do need to switch some players, um, I, I will make sure the players know this in their training. And I'm going to ask them all to wear a T-shirt or tank shirt or tank top underneath their jersey. So if they do have to switch, that you're they're not in a you know difficult situation. What I would say is um, I do envision a lot of the players signing up with coaches that they know. Um, so you will likely know your players. If so, you will know if a certain player is happy to do so or they're a bit more shy. So I mean, obviously, I've I've been a uh, a 17 year old dude if you asked me to change my shirt in the middle of practice when i was 17 i'd be like yep no problem i'd whip my shirt off and put another one on no problem at the same time there's probably another player that you know wouldn't want to take their shirt off it would be the worst thing in the world so be sensitive to that as much as possible try not to get them try not to have your players change their shirts during a practice try and be ahead of the game if it's absolutely necessary maybe there's an injured player now you've got a three versus five or something um, try and maybe keep it to a player that you know is comfortable doing that, if that makes sense. It's going to be a bit of a sensitive situation. Do your best to try and limit the amount of times that you're going to ask a player to do that. Second gear, second gear bag you're going to pick up at your entrance is a specialty coach gear bag. This will have all your PPE in it. Um, so a mask, gloves, personal hand sanitizer, a first aid kit, splints, and a plastic bag to throw away the, the used PPE and obviously the script that you're going to read beforehand. You will collect this at the beginning, the same as your equipment bag. Um, it'll all be cleaned and washed. Um, if, you, if you use the PPE in that bag, you'll put it in the, the garbage bag in the, in the gear bag. I've said bag like 16 times in the last 10 seconds. Um, and that way we can throw it out really easy. If the first aid kit was used, keep it separate, and then we can replace it for the next group that come in uh, with a clean one. The equipment cleaning will be done by the summer staff at the field. That will not be your responsibility. This is partly why we're giving you the gear bags at the field. Um, it means that we have control over what is clean and what is dirty. Um, it has been recommended to us by um, other organizations that players bring their own balls. But in, our, in my mind, at least, it, that doesn't make sense. Like if you bring in a ball from a, a home, now that's going to be pretty contaminated, in, in my opinion, if there's COVID-19 on it. Uh, or in that on that person. So if we provide the balls, um, we're limiting outside stuff being brought in. So we will clean it. Um, all gear will be cleaned before you use it, immediately after you used it as well. So um, if you are the first team on in a weeknight, for example, the gear you use will actually be cleaned twice. It'll be cleaned after the session the night before and before your session on, on that same day. If you are the second session, um, then you will have a gear bag that was probably used um, the session before, but it will have been cleaned in that half an hour gap between practices. Um, upon finishing the session, like I said, yeah, the players will pack up their stuff. You will have to collect the equipment and then you will just leave it in the dirty area, which will be outlined for you. Um, and that's when the summer staff will go to work, getting all that stuff cleaned. 
As I mentioned, it's important that, o that only you touch the equipment with the exception of the balls. And I am sorry, that does suck, I know. Um, the staff who are cleaning it will be wearing their, their face masks and gloves. They go to the dirty area, empty all the stuff, clean it all properly, and then put it all back in. It'll be clean with disinfectant. Um, we have the recommendations from Soccer Nova Scotia and HRM on what disinfectants are the best. So they're the ones that we're going to be purchasing. Um, and then they'll be cleaned and put back in the clean area. So there's no cross contamination between dirty and clean. All right. Um, any questions here? You can't tell the difference if you get tested. You can't tell the difference if you get tested. There's no, you just check for increasing symptoms. Yeah, so I think that's, I think that's, is that, is that you, Pete? United DFC 2007 forms girls? Um, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So Susan said, um, club can provide a, uh, the club will provide a free you reusable cloth mask to anyone who wants them. So if you want one, just let us know. And so, and maybe branded Amanda. Symptoms are related to previous illness. Need to declare. Yep, so, so Rob, as Rob kind of, uh, Followed up there. If you have allergies, just let us know in advance. I'm sorry that the presentation is dropping in and out. Um, it's mainly me talking. If you can, can you guys hear me at least? That's good. That's good. So if you can hear me, I'm I'm, I'm pretty much talking it through anyway. There's not a lot of pictures. How would that work for you? Have you have different players signing up for different practices? So, um, okay. Are you, so, okay, are you happy with that, Sean? Just maybe a yes in the box if you feel like that's been answered. Oh, perfect. That was for signing pennies while they're handing out pennies to players for the season. So that was an idea, Pete. I did think about doing that. My, my issue is if I give out a thousand pennies or even if it's 500 pennies, let's say, um, each one of those costs five bucks. So that's twenty five hundred dollars that we're going to have to either charge the members, or I'm going to have to write off. And it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of money when we can just ask players to wear a shirt. Um, but that was something that we considered. It's a, it's a good idea. Um, in the end, I think it's just easier to say, players wear wear your navy or green or wear a light or a dark. But it, it's it's a, it's a good it's a good idea. Um, that's a good question, Amanda. Um, our coach is allowed to mark the field with cones as needed in the 30 minutes before. So um, the answer is going to be not for the full 30 minutes um, because um, you, you're going to have 15 minute gap to enter the field. So the group previously will have to leave 15 minutes beforehand. So that so okay, let me let me just talk this talk the time through here. If you are the first group on that evening, then yes, technically you could be on the field 30 minutes before beforehand because there's no one before you. At the end of a session, um, you, your team has 15 minutes to leave the field. And then this, the following group have 15 minutes to enter the field. So as a coach, it would make sense for you to be the, at the front of the social distance line. So you're in first, and that will give you 15 minutes to set up, if that makes sense. Um, um, yeah, and the, the cleaning, the cleaning, we are going to have two sets of gear. So one set will always be clean. So you won't be waiting on the, the gear to be clean before you can use it. You'll be, while you're using this set, the other set will be being cleaned, if that makes sense. Good questions. All right. Coach's role. <laughs> Wait, how far through are we here? Okay, we're most of the way through. This is the, the easy bits from here. Coach's role. So before practice, including arrival at the field, we've gone over a lot of this already. Um, first thing, if you have any COVID, if you have any COVID symptoms at all, do not come to the field. So uh, I know we talked about allergies already. Oh, lowercase. I know we talked about allergies already. If you have, if you know there are allergies, and then that's okay. But if you're at home and you're like, I might have some symptoms here, I would much, much rather you don't come to the field, even if it's at the last minute. Safety's got to be safety's got to be number one priority. Give me a call. Uh, I'll make sure you all have my number. Let me know. I will figure it out. Okay. Let, leave that. Leave the coaching situation to me to deal with. You stay home and uh, self isolate if you think you have. Call eight one one. So first thing is any symptoms or any concerns do not come. Um, what you're responsible for planning your session as per usual. We will have our resources as we normally do. Um, and obviously, I can help you with that if you want help planning. Um, 
preparing your team or group for a session. So as we talked about, the pennies maybe, um, if there's certain things you want them to know in advance. So anything you need your team to prepare for. Uh, outside of what color shirt to wear, there isn't anything additional that I think they need to know at this point from you and they do from the club. Um, and then um, advising me or the club of the additional equipment you need for your practice. So if you, if you need two pug nets, for example, um, you know, you gotta, you got to give me a, a bit of notice so I can make sure that that's there. Um, this is from the Sock Nova Scotia form. Before you leave home, do not leave if you're feeling unwell. Eat before you come. There's no food allowed at the fields. Thoroughly wash your hands with soap and water. We're going to have hand sanitizer at the field. And as a coach, you'll have your own personal one. So you'll be able to wash your hands as well whenever you want. Um, obviously, all your essential items, water bottle, sunscreen, everything like that. Make sure you have it for you uh, because sharing is not allowed. And we, as per usual, any field, we don't have the washrooms at the fields. So make sure you use that before you come. And then at the entry gate, we've already been through this pretty thoroughly. Sign in, follow the protocols, grab your equipment bags, and then set up, set up your practice. During the practice, the easy part, just making sure there's no questions. Um, the easy part during the practice, um, just run your session as per usual. So you've got your nine players, which means you have, they can each have a bit more attention. Um, make sure that – just keep an eye on everyone. Make sure they're following protocols. The grant st the summer staff are going to be keeping an eye out as well. So you'll have you'll have eyes there. It's not essential that you'll make, you're watching everyone like a hawk. But um, keep an eye out. Make sure you hurt the players in the same process we talked about. Uh, and then, obviously, you'll be adjusting the equipment. Summer staff are there to help. If you need help, let them know. Not necessarily with your session – the technical side because again you can't have more than 10 so you, as the lead coach you'll be the only person who can coach the session assistants have to be socially distanced as do the summer staff but you know if you see for example a dog again using the same example a dog running across the field um hey sam summer staff dog over there make sure they're aware and they can deal with it that's that's not going to be your responsibility also really important to be aware and we're going to emphasize this quite a lot in the coat in the uh coaches training video the summer staff are a representation of the club on the field so if they ask you to do something we, we, we need you to do it they, it's going to be a little bit strange for some of you because the summer staff are all going to be reasonably young you know like you know, they're all, most of them are university age kids um but like i said we're going to train them pretty intensely so they're going to know the processes inside out they're going to know what to do in certain situations so if a summer staff asks you to do something, please do it. If you don't agree with it, that's perfectly fine. Give me a call afterwards. Let me know, and I'll, I'll tell you if they're right or not. And if they're not, I'll follow up with them. Um, but in that particular moment, uh, we are going to ask you to follow exactly what they say, even if it sounds insane. Does, does that kind of make sense to everybody? That, like I said, that will be a bit weird because uh, there are some young ones there. Um, and along those same lines, if, if you see the summer staff breaking protocol, let me know immediately. As soon as, well, immediate, as soon as, as soon as you have a chance, give me a phone call and let me know because they, well, they, they again, we can't afford mistakes here. Right, after practice, um, keeping your players social distance as they leave the field. I know that makes no sense because they just played soccer for an hour, but those are the protocols. Um, so the quicker you can get off the field, the better. That just gives more time for the other groups, but safety and social distancing must come first. Um, they, the process will become pretty easy as after you've done it once or twice. It'll be the same every single day. So it, it will become pretty quick by the end. Um, yeah, socially distanced players of the field. Collect all your gear, drop it in the correct dirty area, and then report anything you need to to the summer staff and then sign out as per the normal uh, protocols. And then that uh, is you're done. Um, council practice, we touched on this already. Um, we, we, we're not going to be able to give refunds because of the cost in running this up front. Um, so that means if we do have to cancel because of rain out of our control, um, we, 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 do have a, we do have to give the players something. We can't just say, sorry, it's raining tonight. Thanks for your, thanks for your money. That's not really the way the club operates. Like I said, I, I don't expect coaches to have to do this. You know, like if, if you if you're unable or you want a night off or you don't feel comfortable running uh, an online session or maybe you're just not good with computers, whatever the reason is, it doesn't matter. If you're not comfortable, that is where me and the staff will step in and run it for you. All you got to do is let us know. Um, you can even let me know before the season even starts if you'd like. Um, and we can go from there. 
but we, we will be providing uh, online stuff if there is cancellations due to the weather. Uh, and also, if you don't have access to a Zoom link or a, a room or a Google Hangout room, whatever it may be, the club can provide those for you as well. Um, any questions about that last bit? Okay. Um, all right, fields and scheduling. So we've talked about quite a bit of this already. So like I said, this is getting a bit easier now because we're going over um, the stuff we've already talked about here. So the six fields is what we highlighted. Um, the, the, the guidelines for the selection of the fields was basically we need two separate car parks and two separate entrances. What that does for us is it separates the, the, the members as they come in. So two groups aren't overlapping at all. That means if there is, a, heaven forbid, an uh, outbreak, the two groups, just apart from walking on the same piece of grass an hour apart, that they haven't crossed anywhere, which is just going to reduce our risk again. So the six fields, uh, Astral, Astral Drive, Auburn, Cohaba High, Ocean View, Portland Upper, um, and Tallahassee. Um, each one of those, like I said, has two separate entrances, which makes it nice and easy. If you're interested in, uh, I'm not going to go and show you each field map right now. I have got maps for each one. Uh, I just don't think you guys really want to see that right now. If you are interested, let me know and I, I can show you that whenever you want. Um, the way it's going to work, um, we're only going to work on weeknights. Um, the member survey made it pretty clear that weekends aren't something people want. Uh, the vast majority of our club also in the summer go away for weekends and everything is on the weeknights anyway. So we've done our absolute best to stay to weeknights. The way it's going to work, first practice is going to start at 6 p.m. Players are allowed to arrive at 5.45. The summer staff will be there at 5 o'clock getting things set up. We're going to need cones and signage everywhere. So they have a lot of stuff to do. Like I mentioned, if you're a coach and you want to get to the field early and you have that first session, um, I don't see why that would be a problem. You can get to the field probably by 5.30 and well, the summer staff will be there. And I don't see that being a problem. Session will start at 6. Players will be allowed to arrive between 5.45 and 6 o'clock. Um, and then we will start the process to get them on the field. We can start almost immediately if there's no one on the field already. Um, so they should be on the field ready to go you know, by 5.55 if, if everyone's there in time. At the end of your session, it's an hour long, 6 till 7 p.m., the 7 till 7.15 will be when the team now leaves the field. So it's 15 minutes to get yourself socially isolated um, in the lineup, go through the protocols, leave the field. And then between 7.15 and 7.30 is when the second group is now arriving. They can arrive at any time they want, but they'll have to stand in the lineup socially distanced. So if they want to arrive at 6 for a 7.30 start, no problem, but you're going to be stood there for an hour and 15 minutes. So the entry to the field won't start until 7.15. Um, like I said, the first couple of weeks might be a little bit time consuming, but once we get through the habit, um, I feel like we can get um, all 20 players, all 18 players through the, through the gates pretty quickly. Um, and then the second group starts at 7.30 and finishes at 8.30. And then they have, there's no group after that. So the 15 minutes to get them off the field, um, it, it will be plenty of time. Grant, and then the summer staff will stay and obviously clear away all the stuff that needs to be cleared away. Um, the main reason for this, again, is just uh, limiting the mix in between the groups, the crossing of, of the groups. Um, the only session that will be on the weekends is one practice for each treble A team. Um, they have asked for longer practices. I couldn't make it work on the weeknights, but on the weekends we can. Uh, so that one practice on the weekend for the treble A's will be an hour and 30 minutes. Um, that will all be on one field. Again, trying to limit our number of staff that we need. Um, so there will be, well, we're, we're, I talked to the coaches about this one, but um, it'll either be a really early start or it'll be a late finish one way or the other. The uh, fields I've tried to allocate to different groups, but there is some overlap because we want to fit everybody in. Um, so Auburn and Tallahassee are going to mainly be treble A's fields, but there will be some U12 and U18 on there as well. Astral and Ocean View will be the mainly U12 to U18 fields. And Auburn and Cole Harbor High will be the, oh, sorry, no. Auburn and Portland Estates will be the, oh, what am I saying here? Cole Harbor High and Portland will be the mainly skill center fields. 
Um, this isn't all set in so stone. And when I say all set in stone, I, I really mean where the, where the sessions are based. Um, this part over here, the start times and the breaks is set in stone, which fields are that aren't, um, they, they may move around a little bit depending on coach availability. Um, the, the key to the six fields is we have control. We have staff there to manage the entry exit. We have staff there to manage um, any problems. We have staff there to manage breaks and protocols. Um, by going to more than six fields, we won't have the staff to do that. Um, and then we'll be relying on coaches and volunteers to follow the pretty in-depth protocols we're going to need, which I don't think is fair to you guys just yet. Um, when things loosen up a little bit more, we can probably add more fields and uh, take away some of the protocols, but we're not at that point yet. Okay, scheduling. So we've touched on this already. This is a quick one here. Um, and this, so this is a bit of a uh, timeline thing as well. Um, what's going to happen is almost immediate tomorrow, probably, I'm going to send yeah, tomorrow for sure. I'm going to send out a message, an email to everybody. And it's just going to be a Google form with a name, email, and a yes or a no, um, or yes, no, or assistant. And basically, the yes or no is going to tell me if you want to be a lead coach um, or if you don't want to be a lead coach or if you want to be an assistant and, um, and the amount of sessions per week and the style. So once you've done that for me, then um, that means I can now start building what capacity we have for each style um, how many lately coaches we have and how many uh, sessions we have covered by a coach. Once I have all that information, I will send you guys a second link and that will be where you pick your field and time. So that's how the scheduling is going to work. You guys are going to pick that. Just like I said, to start with, we'll ask you to select up to two. And if there's spaces after that, we'll offer you three, four, five, whatever you want. Um, if there's the space. Um, and I got mentioned at the bottom, like I said earlier, if you've got players from previous years you'd like to work with, this is going to be a first come first service for the players. So it might be worth shooting them an email in advance, letting them know. Um, I am making a video tonight for the member survey, so they will know how this works as well. And I'm going to say the same thing in the member survey to them. Um, okay. Clean um, scheduling and fields. Any questions? Well, there will be a minimum number of players who register for a team group, so some groups may not run. Yes, that's absolutely right, um, Susan. Um, if we only have, for example, three players that sign up for a particular session, um, that, that doesn't fit the, uh, the financial um, restraints. So we will have to link that group up with another group. If that happens, what I'll do is um, the two coaches will likely take in turns or at least, at the very least, we'll have a conversation between the three of us and figure out how we want to run it. Uh, maybe one becomes the lead and one's the assistant. Maybe they take in turns. Uh, we'll have that conversation uh, when we get to that point. That's a great point, Susan. Questions on fields or scheduling? Okay. Um, the cleaning process. Not too much you need to know here. I just wanted to put it up here so you're aware. This is going to be done by the summer staff. You will not be expected to clean anything other than your own hands um so don't worry too much about it just wanted to make it completely clear that we that we have processes in place for all this stuff um literally everything will be cleaned after use the pen even down to the pens they use to sign in with so everything will be cleaned with the appropriate disinfectant or soap or whatever it is um and we've got our processes here so there's one for the equipment one for the entry points one for the exit points um and everything else so I don't want to go through too much of this, a bit of a waste of your time. I just wanted you guys to be aware that we, we, we have these processes in place. Okay, we are near the end. Hour and 25 minutes. Sorry, guys. Um, okay, so any questions or anything before I get to the timelines and next steps, which I've already kind of talked about as well? Okay. So this is our treble A timeline. So because the treble A start a week earlier, everything that these guys do is a, about a week earlier. Um, a lot of it is still available for everyone else to do, but the deadlines are just a bit sooner uh, for the AAA coaches. So right now we are here, Wednesday the 24th, that is tonight. Um, like I said, I'm going to send out the, the confirmation co email schedule tomorrow morning. So by Friday night, I'm going to ask the AAA coaches to have confirmed if they are happy to coach um, or not. And then I will have the, the plan schedule sent out by Monday to, to them. And it will basically say, 
Um, these are the 18 sessions for the treble A's. Pick the three that you want to do. Um, there might we might have to be uh, a little bit with with the treble A's in particular. We might have to be a bit nice to each other because if someone sees the email first, they get all the best times. So we might have to be a, a bit. Uh, we might have had some conversations with that, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Then we will announce the, and this is planned for now. Um, obviously, things are changing day to day. I can't, I can't emphasize enough how things, how much things change day to day. It's insane. Um, so the plan right now is to try and get the Treble A program announced to the players by the third of July. Um, the reason that it's a little bit later is because I want to get that schedule created with the coaches first. That's sort of the hold up, I guess, more than anything. First thing, I need to create the videos. We need to do the member survey so that we know how many players we can stand at and set prices. Um, and then I need to make sure the schedule with the coaches makes sense. Um, so we're looking to try and have registration up by Friday, July 3rd. It will be for four days for the treble A's. Uh, this is just treble A's right now still. Um, then the coaches will have the 6th to the 10th to, do, to watch the video and complete the questionnaire for the training. Um, the video, I will try to keep it um, to, to 10, 15 minutes, but it may be longer if it needs to be. Um, obviously, we're following a lot of protocols and guidelines. It will be videos of the processes being done. So it won't just be somebody like me again talking at you. It will be, this is exactly how it looks like, uh, which will be a bit bit more easier to understand. Um, so you'll have, the treble A coaches will have basically five days to complete that. Um, the players will um, have six days, so they will start on the Monday as well, and they'll have their own training to complete. It will be very similar to the coach training, just with some of the stuff taken out they don't need to know. Like, for example, they don't need to know about equipment, collecting the equipment, because that's not something they have to worry about. So they will have the six days. I, I have the coaches finishing a little bit earlier because um, – if you guys don't do the training, then we haven't got a coach. So it's it gives me two days to follow up with you guys that forget. I know we all forget about stuff sometimes. It happens. Um, so it gives me a couple of days to, to follow up. The players, um, I will send reminders to them. But ultimately, if they don't do it, then uh, they, they, know the, they, know, they know the system. They have to get it done. So the Sunday is the day before. Wednesday, the 8th of July, so I'm jumping around a little bit. That was when we will uh, announce the final schedule, but realistically, that will be out on the 3rd anyway. Um, the 8th is just the final confirmation, um, basically because, you know, without doing the official registration, um, I can't confirm anything. Um, but like I said, really, the player release schedule is going to be on the 3rd, um, once we're done, done with the coaches. Uh, me and the summer staff, this won't be for the coaches, so don't worry about the mock run, but this will be for me and the summer staff. We're going to run through a mock run on the Saturday, a couple of days before. And then we finally start on Monday, July 13th. For everyone else, same um, same uh, process, just slightly different dates. So I've given you guys an extra half a week to get the confirmation of coaching done. Obviously, you've got next week before you start so it means we have a bit more leeway so i'll send out the the, the the confirmation of interest to coaching to everybody tomorrow it won't just be the treble a's but the non treble a coaches will have a little bit longer to complete it um same thing with the schedule i'll send that out on the wednesday to everyone who is confirmed to want a coach and then you will have uh, basically half a week five days to complete when you want to um coach your sessions and what time and what field we will do the normal club program and calling it normal club um, right now. I haven't got a better name for it. We will complete the normal club program announcement on the, the Tuesday, the 7th, which is um, four days after the treble A's. And then that gives us a week now. So rather than three or four days for the treble A's, because obviously there's less of them, we have a week for player registration. Um, the coach training will start the same day as the treble A's, but you guys have an extra week to get it done. So you basically have two weeks. Um, and then the player health training, um, as soon as registration is done, they will have uh, six days to get that done. And that's all online. Same, same idea here with the player release schedule. They will actually know it on the 7th, but just if, if there's any changes, that will be done by the 16th. And then we will do our mock field runs for the other four or five fields on the 18th with a program start of July 20th. <sighs> 
And I think that is it. So sorry that I've just spoken for 90 minutes at you guys. I couldn't even see your faces, just made it worse. Um, so let me just go through the questions here and then I'll open it up to everybody. Sorry, Mr. Beginning for the Treble A team. Is the whole team practicing the same field, same time, but divided in half? Yes, Peter. For the Treble A teams, all, all 17 or 18 players will be at the same field, divided into half. Um, so you will need two coaches there, one to lead each half, um, because the coaches uh, can only work with one set of players at a time. Groups of nine players can be changed from practice to practice. Yes. So from practice to practice, so the, this is just a really just for the treble A's, but um, from practice to practice, you can change the mix of those nine players within your two groups. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop presenting here. So will there be suggested format and material for the Zoom calls when needed? That's a good idea. That's a good call, uh, Scott. Um, we can absolutely do that if you, if you would like. Um, yeah. We can definitely do that. I can uh, start um, building some ideas about things we could do in some some sessions for sure. Is there any other any other questions? Anything that jumps out of you? That jumps out at you? Can the head coach run the session from one half? Um, so, with regards to the coaches. Um, the reason we're only allowed nine players is because the 10th person who is allowed to have contact is the coach. The SNS told us this last night. The reason being, if someone gets injured, the coach has to be the one that's responsible to uh, go and help that player out. So the answer to your question is yes, the head coach can run the session from one half, but they have to socially distance. So they wouldn't be allowed to get in there and, and you know run a, and do the session as well as they maybe would like um yeah so yeah so if you have two assistants for example one's leading one half one's leading the other half and you're stood in the middle sort of di di directing you can do that but you're you as the head coach won't be allowed to go in and do anything with those either of those groups if that makes sense it's a good question um anything else anyone else jump to mind Can we do groups of eight with both coaches participating? Um, that's a good question. I would have to go back to uh, the board with that one because it basically just means we lose a player, uh, which may affect the costing, the costs. Um, so at this point, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say one coach can join and the other one has to socially distance. But if that changes, I will let you know. I'll have to ask um, our treasurer about that one. But at this point, I'm going to say no. It's a good question there. A any other questions? Can one practice one over? No. Um, you're allowed 10 people on the field at once um, that are allowed full contact. Oh, and one of those players um, has to be the coach in case of an injury. So it's nine players plus one coach. Have costs been shared? No. So the costs, we, we're not 100% sure of the costs yet. We, we have a really good idea of what it's going to cost the club to run this. But the problem we got is we don't know who is definitely signing up yet. So tomorrow we're going to send out a member survey along with a video. So the members are going to know exactly what it looks like. And then, then we will have a pretty good idea of how many players we're going to have. And then we can base that fixed cost, what we know it's going to be, um, and divide it by all the players. So... Uh, we're hoping to know the cost per session within the next couple of days. If only eight players show up, both coaches could make 10. Yep, yeah, that's that's true. Um, yeah, that's fair. Uh, maybe what I would suggest if that happens, so if you, if for example, a player hasn't shown up and you have two coaches, I would maybe suggest letting the summer staff at the field know so they don't come running across and be like, why have you got two coaches playing? So maybe just make the summer staff aware and that should be fine. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good point, Susan. But we cannot have more than 10. That is right. Okay, so um, I really appreciate your guys' time and your patience over the last few weeks. Um, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. What's going to happen from here? Like I said, I've recorded this, so um, I will download this tonight and send it out to, to the coaches group. 
Um, so if you want to watch it back, you can. Um, tomorrow morning, um, I will send out that um, Google form. I'll have the very basic information just to basically figure out if you are happy to be a lead coach as we currently have it, what your preferred style, age, gender, and yeah, style, age, and gender would be. Um, and then I can start building some um, accurate schedules, I guess. Um, and then once we have that, I will get out the schedule to you and you guys can select your practices. Exciting, convoluted, but exciting. I, I agree, Pete. It's definitely convoluted. Um, okay, if there's no more questions, I, again, I thank you for your time. And uh, I will be in contact in the next couple of days. Thank you very much, guys. It's exciting. We're nearly there. Thanks, Adam.